Okay, good evening. <laughs> Welcome back to another Talmud class. And this is an exclusive one. This is one on Lagba Omer. Why am I saying this? Why am I dedicating this one to Lagba Omer? Because if you look at your calendar, you'll see that there is no Talmud class next week. Because next week, Thursday, is Lagba Omer. And instead of a Talmud class, everyone who's around this table and everyone in Daytona, Volusia County, Flagler County, are invited to Camp Winona at 5, 5 p.m., 5 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., Camp Winona next week, Thursday, a grand Lagba Omer event. Come there, come with your kids, come with the family. There's a barbecue going on, there's outdoor activities, there's water activities. Come there and be involved. So that is next Thursday afternoon, 5 to 8.30 p.m., Camp Winona in near Ormond Beach just down Route 40, off, the, off Route 40. So because of that, we are now in the, we're now in the spirit of Lagba Omer. And the truth is, I was going to give a Talmud class tonight, it's continuing on in Tractate Brachas. After looking at the calendar and realizing it was Lagba Omer, I decided literally at the last minute, let's change gears. Let's talk about Lagba Omer. Yeah. So what is Lagba Omer? Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, which is the 18th of Iyar, commemorates many, many things. Uh, before we get to the Talmud on Lagba Omer, first things first, it is the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We're going to talk about who he was. Uh, he passed away on the 33rd day of the Omer. Well, on the day that he passed away, he taught, he gathered all of his closest students around him, and he taught them the mystical teachings of the Torah, the secrets called the Kabbalah. Kabbalah literally means to receive. To receive. You see, the mystical hidden parts of the Torah were always kept hidden, and they were not known to the masses. The reason they were not known to the masses was because they feared, those who were able to access Kabbalah feared, that because there was so much power, inner power in the Kabbalah, and because it could be taken and interpreted in many ways which could bring it down in a negative way, they felt it should not be in the hands of those who could harm it. And so therefore it was only called Yechidei Segula, only to elite people who the rabbis felt worthy of getting, gaining access to this, only then were they taught the secrets called the Kabbalah. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was the first one who revealed this, teachings of the Torah, not necessarily to the masses, but to many of his students. And when did he reveal all of these secrets of the Torah? It was on the 33rd day of the Omer, 18th of the ER, the day that he passed away. And so therefore, this day is commemorated, the day that he passed away. He instructed his students that it should not be a sad day, but it should be a happy day. This, by the way, what I'm saying is, is Medrash Rabbah. And so therefore, therefore, this day is commemorated as a happy day, and also the celebration of the mystical revelations, the revelations of the mystical teachings of the Torah. For this reason, we have bonfires. The fire represents the fire, the spiritual fire of Torah, which is the mystical teachings, the revelation of the mystical teachings. It says when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai passed away, his entire house, there was a pillar of fire that was emanating from his house. So to commemorate that, we have bonfires. We go out into the fields. We'll explain why in a second. We have this concept of playing with bows and arrows. By the way, the Lubavitch Rebbe has a beautiful teaching on that. Why do we... Why do we use bow and arrows. I'm going to say this very quickly because everything that we do, Torah and mitzvahs, is all using our actions, our speech, our thoughts. We're using our thoughts, speech, and action for the sake of doing a mitzvah or doing Torah or learning Torah. But after all, the thoughts, speech, and action are all garments of ourselves. It's only the external part, the outside part of our body. But how do we access the inner part of our body? How do we access the flame the excitement. Because if you go deeper than the garments, what drives us to do Torah mitzvahs in the first place? It is our soul. It's our neshama. It is our av of the year. It's our love and fear of God. That is our drive. That's the fire and the enthusiasm to do what we have to do. It's very hard to access that part because everything that we do is only through our garments, the thought, speech, and action. So what we need really is to have something that taps to our heart, taps close to our heart. When we, when we do something that taps due to our heart, we are accessing that fire of our soul, which in turn gives us the enthusiasm and drives us to do more Torah mitzvahs. 
What is that fire? Chassidus, Kabbalah, the mystical teachings of the Torah. So, the analogy of that, to understand that better, is it used to be to go to war, they had swords and they had spears. Combat was face to face. But then they realized that in order to better conquer the enemy, it is necessary to, to invent devices that would not allow, that, that would be able to avoid having to combat face to face. So, what did they first invent? The bow and arrow. The bow and arrow is this device that prevents a spring reaction to the arrow that causes it to shoot far so that they can shoot the enemy without being close by. Right? Now, how does the mechanism of a bow and arrow work? In, for an archer to shoot the arrow, first he takes the arrow and he draws it near towards his heart and aims. And as he draws it near to his heart, when he lets go, the power, the, the, the what's it called? Arrow. The theory of relativity, the, the chain-like reaction, with every action as a reaction, bring the, bring the arrow close to the heart, shoots it far. And that's what Hasidus and the mystical teachings are all about. For us to reach far in Judaism, it is necessary to bring the arrow close to our heart. Which, and in Luke speaking, when, from analogy we understand this to mean, when we bring something which is Hasidus, when we learn the mystical teachings of the Torah, which brings godliness to, close to your heart, you are then able to shoot further, which means your Judaism is going to be much more richer and more everlasting. And so that is the Lubavitch Rebbe's teaching on the secret behind our custom of using the bow and arrow on Lagva Omer. So, it all starts with Rabbi Akiva. It all starts with Rabbi Akiva. Who is Rabbi Akiva? So again, there's a, there's, this is from Avis to Rabbi Nassim, which is Rabbi Nassim, the sage of the Amir of the Talmud, and he has a work called Avis to Rabbi Nassim. And he brings the following story, which has now become famous. Where did Akiva begin? So, as the story goes, he was as a forty-year-old. As a forty-year-old, he began to learn Torah. Before forty years old, he was a simpleton and even scoffed at Torah scholars. At some point, he began working for a rich person, one of the richest people in Israel. His name was Kalba Savua. He was known as Kalba Savua, which in Hebrew, the Hebrew version is Kelev Savua. A, a satiated, satisfied dog. Why was he called Kalba Savua? It was actually a compliment to him. He was so rich and so generous, he always had guests by his table, guests in his house, and they were so satiated and so satisfied after being in his household, they were satiated like a dog. Like a dog who eats and eats and eats and eats and eats until they're very satisfied, until they poop. So he was nicknamed Kalba Savua. Because he made everyone satisfied like a dog. Alright. So this rich, generous man hired Akiva, Akiva ben Yosef, as his name was known, to come work in his fields. And as he's working over there, he comes upon a rock. And he sees that there's water. He sees that there's a hole in the rock and there's water dripping on the rock. And at first he wonders, why is it that the water is penetrating the rock? And someone comes over to him and it says, doesn't it say in the book of Eiv that wisdom penetrates a person's mind like water penetrates a heart, a uh, rock? And he says to himself, ah, must be that if a water can penetrate a rock, a water, drip, 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 can penetrate a rock, the Sotu Torah is capable of penetrating my thick head if I put my mind to it. He decided that he wanted to learn Torah. It was also to the credit of a girl who was the daughter of Kalba Savua. Her name was Rachel. The Talmud tells us her name, gives us her name. Her name was Rachel. And she was so inspired by Akiva. She knew that he was a wise person. If only he would learn Torah, he would become great. And so therefore she decided, she told him, if you decide to learn Torah, I want to marry you. Akiva agreed. And Rachel told that to her father. Kalba Savua. Kalba Savua was in shock. His daughter will marry such an ignoramus. He told his daughter, if you marry this man, I will disown you. Disown you. Rachel says, I don't care. I am certain that this man will become a big rabbi. She married him. The father disowned her. And she went from being a daughter of a multi-millionaire, billionaire, to 
literally having straw in her hair after spending the night sleeping on straw on the floor in a mud hut. But she did this all for the sake of her husband. At some point she sent her husband away telling him, go learn Torah, this is the reason why we are married. Akiva went to the great sages, Rabbi Yeshua. He went to Rabbi Elizabeth Nazari, I believe. He sat at Rabbi Gamliel. He sat at their feet for 12 years. When he came back, he had 12,000 students. He had 12,000 students. He approached the door. He was coming back home, and he had an entourage of 12,000 students. And he heads back to this house after 12 years of not being there. And he's about to walk into the door. He's about to knock on the door saying, Honey, I'm home. And suddenly he hears noises. He puts his ear to the door. And he hears his wife, Rachel, speaking to another lady. And then the other lady is basically chastising Rachel, saying, Woe to you, you poor lady. Look at you. Look how your husband deserted you. Look how he left you. you. For 12 years, just like this, you have to fend for yourself. And Rabbi Akiva then heard his wife, Rachel, say to the other woman, on the contrary, I am so happy knowing that my husband is away learning Torah. As long as I know that he is learning Torah, I'm prepared to live like this another 12 years. Rabbi Kiva did not knock on the door. He did not knock on the door. He turned around, went back, he, and sat for another 12 years. And when he came back, when he came back, he had double. He had 24,000 students. When he came, Rachel the righteous wife heard that her husband was coming back. She went out to greet him. No, none of the students knew who she was. They thought she was a lunatic. They tried to push her away. Rabbi Akiva called out, Absolutely not, bring her near. If not for her, all of my terror and everything that I have is all hers. At Kalba Savua, his father-in-law, who for the last 24 years had no idea who his daughter, where his daughter was, he disowned her. He found out there's a great rabbi coming to town. And he comes, he sees Rabbi Akiva, he didn't recognize him after 24 years. He comes to him, he falls at his feet, and he gives him the greatest honor. And Rabbi Akiva reveals to him who he is. Now, Kabul Savua, he again fell to the feet out of embarrassment and begged for forgiveness. And Rabbi Akiva, of course, said that he shouldn't have nothing to be upset about. It's all from God. And Kabul Savua declared in front of everybody, that I no longer disown my daughter. In fact, this is what became of my son-in-law. What a son-in-law. I am now doing just the opposite. All my wealth I'm giving to Rabbi Akiva. And overnight, Rabbi Akiva, of course, became not only a great sage, but one of the wealthiest people in Israel. This is the story of Rabbi Akiva. Now let's talk about his 24,000 students who he acquired. So, here's where we begin. So the Talmud Yavamis Daf Samach Beis Amud Beis, Tractate Yavamis 62, Side B. You have it in your handouts, the first one. And it says like this the, the Gemara, the Talmud introduces this episode to us by first saying, uh, Rabbi Yeshua Omer, the Tanya Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua teaches us. Nasa Adam Isha Biyaldusa Bayaldusa Isa Isha Biziknusa. If a man marries a woman while he's still young, he should marry a woman as he becomes old. Which means if the person for whatever reason no longer has a wife as he gets older, for whatever unfortunate things happen, either through divorce or the wife tragically dies, he should not give up but marry again. Just because a person has children when he is young, as he grows older, he should not give up hope and have children even later. There is no such thing as because I am a little older than most people, therefore I am incapable of raising a family. The person should never think that way. The person should never think that way. It is kind of on the theme of what we have this upcoming Sunday, which is Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni, this, this holiday of Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, originated because there were a couple of men who were impure and unable to bring the first Paschal Lamb. They came to Moses and complained, why should we lose out? Because we were impure. Why were they impure? Because they were carrying the coffin of Joseph, of Yosef, throughout the, through the desert. And God basically gave the message, because these people said, Lama Nigara, why, are we, why do we miss out? 
God decided to institute another holiday of Pesach Sheni, a second Passover, for, with the message, as we say in Yiddish, there's no such thing as those who have fallen, meaning there's always a second chance. So that's the theme of this upcoming Sunday, Pesach Sheni, there's always a second chance. And the same thing over here with this Talmud tells us whether a person needs a second chance with marriage or having children, there's always a second chance that a person should never give up hope. Where, what's the origin of this? Shnemar, the verse says in Klehelis, is is Celestes? Ecclesiastes. E- Ecclesiastes? I can never Ecclesiastes. Klehelis, yeah. written by King Solomon Shleiman Malach. And he says like this, in the morning, plant your seeds. Erev, and at evening, al tinach yadcha, do not rest your hand. Ki kasher, because you do not know which one will be more influential, will be more will be more powerful. A whether this person, whether the former or the latter, meaning, for example, children. Do not give up, do not stop having children, even if a person gets older, because you don't know which child is going to give you the most pride, the most nachas, whether it's the, the former child or the other child, you do not know. This is a saying from Rosh Hashanah I have no experience, I'm just uh, quoting stuff. I have experience with two young babies, what do I know? And you do not know if both of them are good, right? Shalom HaMalach does not negate the fact that you could have nachat from all of your children. But because you do not know from which one you'll have nachat from or whether you have from both of them, so have both. That's basically the, that's basically the advice given to us. Now, which rabbi do we learn this concept from that's never too late and you always start, even if you grow older, you never stop? From Rabbi Akiva. From Rabbi Akiva. As we just said from the story of Avis Barab Nassan, when did he start learning Torah? When he was 40 years old. When he was 40 years old. Rabbi, which is very, very young. It's very young. 40, 40 years old. 40. Very, very young. Rabbi Akiva Omer. Rabbi Akiva says, Lama Torah bi'aldusai, yilmei Torah The same thing that we mentioned about marriage and about children, the same concept applies when it comes to learning Torah. If a person learned Torah... He or she was a child, five years old, six years old, ten years old, twenty years old, as a child. Yeah, even twenty year old could be children. <laughs> Ask anyone with twenty year old kids; it could be children too. I'm a child. Yeah. <laughs> when you grow older, and as you advance in years, don't stop learning Torah. Don't just say because I'm growing older, I'm going to stop learning Torah. In fact. The Lubavitcher always advocated the fact that there should not be any concept of retirement. The Rebbe, the Rebbe was against retirement because, what does it mean retirement? You only stop when uh, you're moving to the next world. Well, we're, as every single day that we're in this world, we have a purpose. And you look at all of these great rabbis, even in the contemporary rabbis of today, you can see um, someone who just passed away, um, uh, Rabbi Steinman. That was his name? Or Steinman, Steinman, 104 years old. He yeah, wrote a book, Ayel Hashachar. He was a very great rabbi, a great posek. He just passed away. He was still le- learning and leading at 104 years old. Rabbi Yaakov, that was also a very great rabbi, also passed away about 100 years old. So the concept of retirement doesn't exist in Judaism. Every single day that we're here, we do something. Where do we learn this from? Rabbi Akiva. If someone had students when in his youth, he should not stop and have students when he grows older. Where do we learn this from? Rabbi Akiva. Why? Because from this verse, in the morning you should sow your seed, etc. And what's the second part of the verse? Of Erev, Erev, Al Tinach Yadcha. But at evening, which means as you come advanced in years, do not rest. Do not rest. Omru, they said. Shneim asar elav zugim talmidim hayalei l'Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 sets of students. Sets means times two. He had 24,000 students. 12 sets means every, every, every student had what we call a chaver or a chavruta in Aramaic. 
a study partner. So they had pairs. So there were 24,000 students. Megevus Ad Antifras. This is a place in Judea, present day Judea, from two different cities, Givat and Antifras. Those two cities in between them, that's where these students resided. What happened to them? The Kulan Mesu Beperek Echad. And they all died. All 24,000 students died in a certain period of time. Why? Because they did not honor each other. They did not give honor to each other. And there's a famous... Hello, Rabbi Farkash. He says he's here. And there's a famous teaching of, Rabbi, of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of asking, well, what do you mean the students of Rabbi Akiva did not honor each other? One second. Rabbi Isaac, we just gave a sermon this past Shabbos. Which rabbi was it that taught us that that the mitzvah, which we just had in this past week's parsha, love your the neighbor, your fellow as yourself, says the, this rabbi, this is the greatest klal gadol, this is the greatest rule on which entire Torah is based upon. Which rabbi was that? Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva was all about the teaching of Avas Yisrael, loving your fellow, and here his own students are not honoring each other. Something doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. What was that? Hello? Hillel said another thing. The Rabbi Yisrael talked that also. He taught that person who walked into his room, Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. Similar concept. Similar concept. But Rabbi Akiva taught us that the mitzvah, the, the commandment of Ahavas Yisrael is the Klal Gadol Bater, is the greatest principle, greatest role of the whole Torah. What does it mean his students didn't honor each other? So the Rabbi teaches us something very, very fascinating. And I'll say this in short. No, it's not like they didn't love each other. They loved each other so much that they wanted to help one another. It's like saying one, they were having two chabrosas, two study partners, and each one said, I understand this to be the best way of understanding this Talmud. And I have such great love for you, I have such great love for you, that I feel for your sake, the only way you'll understand it is if you understand my way. Because I want to help you so much. I have such love for you, I want to help you so much. And the other person said, No, but I love you so much, and therefore I want you to understand my understanding, because it's my understanding that's going to help you. That, that's what it meant they didn't honor each other. But not chas v'shal, not heaven forbid that they didn't honor each other. They honored each other so much that they didn't even realize that they were not honoring each other. They had such love for each other that they wanted to help them, not realizing that their way that their way of helping one another was warped. They didn't understand it that way. God punished them quite harshly. They all died in a certain period of time. The world was desolate. The world was empty, empty of Torah, because the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died. Now Rabbi Akiva, remember, when did he acquire these 24,000 students? 24 years after he began learning Torah. When did he begin learning Torah? At 40. So how old is he now? 64. So you think at 64, one year before the average person today is retiring, right? Okay, time to retire. <laughs> All my students died. Well, what do you want from me? No, Rabbi Kiva didn't stop there. He led by example. He said, you learn, you have students as you are young, have students as you are old. You learn Torah while you are young, you continue learning Torah as you're old. This is what Rabbi Akiva taught us. So what does he do? Until Rabbi Akiva came to our rabbis who were in the south, and he taught them Torah. Who were his students? Who were his people who he approached to and he turned them into rabbis in the south? Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yoisi, Rabbi Shimon, that's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. These five students, Rabbi Mary, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, these were the five students of Rabbi Akiva who became his students after, mm. after the other 24,000 students died. Now these five students who came from the fact that Rabbi Akiva did not give up, the results were these five students. They weren't just any five students. Oysa Shah Tana Heim heim hemidu taira, oisha sha'a. 
they were the ones that were responsible for the upkeeping of the learning of Torah in their generation. Meaning, without these five students, Torah would be completely forgotten and non-existent today. The fact that we have Torah till today is because of these five students. You look at these names. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Elizabeth, and Shamua. There's another Gemara, Talmud Sanhedrin, which tells us, Stam Mas Rabbi Meiri. Any Mishnah that you read that has no name to it, it's Rabbi Meir, who was the first of his students. Every time Rabbi Meir says something, Rabbi Huda always has a counter argument. It says, Stam Halacha Rabbi Yehuda. The average Halacha, the average Jewish law is established because of Rabbi Yehuda. And like Rabbi Yossi, Stam Halacha Rabbi Shimon. It says another place, and the average teaching is taught by Rabbi Shimon. Stam Rabbi Shimon. Whenever it says Rabbi Shimon, which is one of the foremost sages of the Amiram of, of the of the Talmud, is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua was known as a Maturgaman. He was the greatest interpreter of Torah in his generation. He was actually one of the ten martyrs. Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, one of the ten martyrs. So you see, and by the that same Talmud, by the way, that says Stam Mestis and Rabbi Meir here, Stam Alacha Rabbi Shimon. All the Torah that we know today is because of these five rabbis. What does that Mishnah finish off by saying? The Kulhu Alibad Rabbi Akiva. And everything that they taught is all credited to Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva is responsible for everything that we know today. So Tana Kula Mesu Mi Pesach They all died from Pesach until Shavuos during this period of time. Amar Abhama Bar Abba Vitemar Abhiya Bar Avan Kula Mesu Misaro, they all died a horrible death. Maihi, what is it? Um Rab Nachman Askara. They died of a sickness called Askara. Elsewhere in the Talmud it tells us Askara is the most harshest of all sicknesses. It is the hardest and harshest of all sicknesses. I hope I pronounce this properly. In modern many people associate it with the modern medical sickness term called diphtheria or diphtheria. No, dip. Diphtheria. 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 Yes, which is a medical condition which causes the throat to thicken, an inflammation from a bacteria which causes the throat to thicken, which causes a person to suffocate. So if they suffocate very, very slowly, and it causes cardiac arrest, heart failure, it causes shortness of breath, and ultimately death. So it's a very slow and very, very painful death akin to strangling. But very, very slow. Like something like a rope? Yeah, that's right. Chimic. That's right. Also in the Talmud, it tells us that the harshest of all deaths is Askara, and the easiest of all deaths was the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> what was the harshest of deaths? Askara, which is, which is akin to pulling a needle out, uh, uh, t- pulling out um, uh, a needle through a, a tied a rope made out of straw. So it's tugging and tugging and tugging. And the death... Of of Moshe Rabbeinu of Moses is akin to pulling a hair out of milk. That was the yeah, that, that's I hope I, I I hope I quoted that accurately. That's a story. So that is why we have the concept called Sphira. That's why between Pesach and Shavuos, it is considered a sad time, which is ironic, as the Ramban Nachmanides points out to us. Really, the truth is that you can make a Shehechiyanu, the blessing of Shehechiyanu during Sefira time, unlike, let's say, the three weeks or the nine days, which is going to happen before the ninth day of, of the Saturday day of the year. Those days, you cannot make a blessing of Shehechiyanu because it's a sad time. <coughs> but the truth is, explained to us Nachmanides, this time between Pesach and Shavuos is actually a holy day. It's a happy time. We can even make a blessing Shehechiyanu because this time is, is supposed to be spiritual heights. It's a time of spiritual heights. It's a time when we work on our behavior. It's a time we work on the character traits. It's a time when we get ready for receiving the Torah, which, the, which is fulfilling the whole purpose of creation. And, it's, and it's, it's really tragic, explains the Ramban and the Marsha, by the way, that in the highest of heights, in the most auspicious times, that students are dying every single day. And so the Marsha explains, a uh, former commentary in the Talmud, he explains to us, this was because God was sending a message that the fact that the students were dying during this time had nothing to do with the day itself, the mazel, the divine energy of the day itself, but all hashkacha al it was all divine intervention. 
everything directly from God and to show them that it was because of something spiritual and nothing because of the mazel, the divine energy of that day. That is why the students were taken out during that time, which was supposed to be a, a good time, a heavenly time. Okay, so that is why we commemorate Sphira this time between Pesach and Shavuos in a sad way because so many students were dying. That is why we traditionally do not listen to live music or for that matter any instrument, um, instrumental music, yeah, orchestral, no, what, what do we call it? Yeah, instrumental music uh, because, because of this concept we traditionally we do not get haircuts. Some take a haircut like Lagba Umar, some wait until Shavuos, Chabad customers to wait until Shavuos. And we don't get married during this time. If, if a child, if a boy turns three, we do not have an upshanish during this time. When Magba Omer comes around, then whoever turned three has their upshanish. If a, if a couple wants to get married, they could get married on Magba Omer, but they don't get married outside of that during this period of time because it's a sad time. Okay, so now we said that this is the origins. This is where it's all starting from, this concept of sphere. However, the day of Magba Omer changes everything. The day of Lagba Umar changes everything. Let's see why. And here we turn, here we turn to another Talmud, another Gemara, which is Gemara Shabbos, Daf Lamed Gimel on the base, Tractate of Shabbos, page 33, side B. And it starts off like this. There was a Tana of those Rabbi Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi. He, he was called Rabbi Huda Bari Lai, Rabbi Huda who was elevated, literally. And by the way, we're going to learn about a story of Rabbi Huda Bari Lai, who was one of the greatest sages of the Talmud also. And he was a, he lived in the times of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, the student of Rabbi Akiva. We are going to learn through the following story, the following famous story of how he got the name Rabbi Huda Bari Lai. Rabbi Yehuda, the elevated one, the head of all speakers. Interestingly enough, for those who have been to Israel before, if you travel to Meiron, if you travel on the road to Meiron, right outside Meiron, you actually pass by the, the burial place of Rabbi Yehuda Bar Yilei. It was right there on the road going into Meiron, where the city, the town where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai is buried as well. So they are actually buried very close to each other. So now here's the story. Um, the, the Talmud is asking this question. Why, how did Rabbi Yehuda Bar Yilai, Rabbi Yehuda the Elevated, how did he earn his name? And this is the question that will lead us into the famous story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. And now we're going to learn the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai as it is written directly in the text of the Talmud. It says the Talmud as follows. Why was Rabbi Yehuda Bar Yilai, Rabbi Yehuda the Elevated, known as the Rosh HaMadavrim, the head of all speakers, Bechol Makim, in every place that he was? Why, was? why did he earn that nickname, the head of all speakers? Because the story goes, says the Talmud, the Yasri, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Shimon. There were three rabbis that were sitting together. One was Rabbi Yehuda, this Rabbi Yehuda Bar Yilai. There was Rabbi Yosef who, by the way, we said before, was also one of the five students of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yossi was one of them. And Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. V'yosif Yehuda ben Geirim Gabayu. There was another man called Yehuda ben Geirim, Yehuda the son of converts, and he was sitting among them. He was sitting among them. Hasach Rabbi Yehuda Amar. In their discussion, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Yilai opened up the discussion and said, how wonderful are the actions of this government who we're under, which is the Roman government. How wonderful is this government we are under. They've instituted marketplace, they've established marketplaces. They've instituted, they've built bridges. They have set up bathhouses. How wonderful. How wonderful. Look at the wonders of, of Roman infrastructure and the way that they've set up their cities with bathhouses, with, with bridges, and with marketplaces. That's Rabbi Yehuda Bar He started speaking. Rabbi Yossi Shosak. Rabbi Yossi sat there and remained quiet. Nene Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, who was sitting there as well, nodded his head. The Omar, and he said, 
Call Masha Tiknu Le Tiknu El Not true. Everything that the Roman government have have established, have built, it's only for their own benefits. What does it mean for their own benefits? Tiknu Shvakan Lahishabem Zainos. They've built marketplaces in order to have prostitutes roaming around, right? It, the prostitutes are hanging around the marketplaces. That's, that's where you can find a prostitute. They've built bathhouses for the sake of their own pleasure, to pleasure themselves. They've only built bridges for the sake of uh, putting up a toll, to toll, to make a toll point, to build turnpikes. To build turnpikes and collect taxes. That's the only reason why they're building bridges. So it's all for their own benefit. That was Rabbi Shimon Bayechai. So basically, Rabbi Yudha Bayelai spoke good against the government. Rabbi Yossi was quiet. And Rabbi Shimon retorted and spoke against the government. Saying it's only for their own benefit. In a derogatory way. Halach Yehuda ben Gerim. So Yehuda ben Gerim who was sitting there as well. He went to the Devreim. He spoke over these words, says Rashi. He spoke it over to his household. He was sitting by the dining room table. They were eating dinner. And he said, you know what I heard from Rabbi Shimon Bar Chai, Rabbi Yudabai, Rabbi, you heard what I heard today? And he told them what, what happened. V'nishmul l'malchus. And before long, they spread the word, one ear to the other. And the rumor, Rums. the story went around until it reached the government themselves. L'malchus. It reached the government. Amru, so the government decreed. Yehuda she'ila yis'ale. Yehuda, the rabbi Yehuda, who spoke good, who elevated us, he will be elevated. He will be given a high position in the government. So that's, this is the, that's how the Talmud brought us in. That's how he earned the name Rabbi Yehuda bar Yilai. The Rabbi Yehuda, the elevated one, because he got elevated in the government. Yaisi she'sasak. Yigala, Yigala. Rabbi Yossi, who was quiet, is going to be exiled, let's see, He, They were living in Judea at that point, and he was in Yavna. He was exiled to Tsipari, which is in the, in the Galil, in the upper Galil. Shimon, Shagina, Yeharek, Yeharek. Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, who spoke, Lignai, who spoke in a derogatory way against the government, will be executed. He should be killed. Azalhu Ubrei Tasha Be Midrasha. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, whose name was Rabbi Elazar, they hid in the local study hall in the base medrash in the shul. Kol Yoyma have a ma'isilu divisu rifta v'chuzah demaya. Every single day, the wife would bring them bread, a loaf of bread, and a pitcher of water. Lachar, yeah. When it came time that the decree, that the decree became more harsh, intensified. What does it mean intensified? That they started to say that, they started to say that they put a, a, a most wanted on Rabbi Shimon, saying anyone who has information leading to the whereabouts of Rabbi Shimon and they don't reveal to us, they are going to be punished as well. So that's what it means the decree got intensified. He, he became on the most wanted list. It was at that moment that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai realized that hiding in the local study hall is now too dangerous and will not benefit him and will cause harm to his family if he remains there. And so what does he do? He comes up with a genius decision. Amalei Lebrei, Nashim Daiton Kalaleim. Women, their minds are lighthearted. What does it mean, lighthearted? Now, not in a derogatory way. Women are very, very wise. Let's not negate that. However, says Rabbi Shimon to his son, women, they have a very close connection with emotion. And when things get too emotional, it's much harder for them not to give in. And he was afraid. Dilma mitzari lo megali Perhaps they will capture her because she's, after all, my wife. They're going to torture her because they want to know where my whereabouts. And under the pain of torture, she might, she might give in and reveal my whereabouts. So let's run away. Let's escape. And we will not even tell my wife 
that we're escaping. In this way, she will truly not know where we are. And so therefore, they won't be able to harm her because she will, she'll be speaking the truth, saying she honestly does not know what happened to us. So what do they do? Azlu Tasha B'marasa. They ran out to the fields and they hid in a cave. Yisrachish Nisa, a miracle occurred for them immediately. Ivulahu Charuva, a carob tree grew next to the cave. The Eina Demaya, and suddenly a stream of water began passing along the cave. So now they had immediate access to food and water. Right? So now they, had, now they were in a spiritual bubble. They were in a cave. They had a carob tree, so they had immediate foods to eat. You're saying they, he and his son? He and his son. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, Rabbi Elazar, they sat together in this cave. Carob tree, which by the way, in itself was a tremendous miracle. A carob tree usually takes, I think, 70 years or something to grow, grow fruits. And here a carob tree sprung up right away. And they had a stream of water, so they had everything they needed. They didn't need to go anywhere. Okay, so they had these two things. So what did they do? They used to remove all of their clothing and bury themselves in sand all the way up until their necks so that they are completely covered, you know, modestly. They, have, they stripped themselves bare and instead covered the sand all the way up to the neck for the sake of preserving their clothing so that their clothing don't become worn out. So in order to do that, they did not wear their clothing during the daytime. They used to take it off, cover themselves with sand, and as they are covered, they used to learn Torah that way, covered in sand. When it came time, when it came time to daven, when it came time to pray, then they would put their clothing on and they would pray. But when they were not wearing their clothing, they would, when they were not praying, they would take off the clothing and then pray and then and learn Torah. For the sake, why? For the sake of preserving their clothing, so that it does not get worn out. This went on for twelve years. They sat in the cave and they learned for twelve years. Asa Eli until one day, the Roman emperor died, and the rule in Rome, in ancient Rome, was whenever an emperor dies. Any decree that he institutes gets gets dissolved, dissolves. And so one of the decrees that the Roman emperor was, was putting a price on Rabbi Shimon's head. But now that he died, the decree was abolished. The decree became, it was dissolved. So now Rabbi Shimon didn't know this, right? He's out there in the field in the cave. It was the only social, the only social, um, the only access to anybody was his own son, Rabbi Lazar. He had no access to the outside world. He was in the bubble for 12 years. So how would he know that the decree was abolished? How does he know that he could return back to civilization? So Elio Hanavi, Elijah the prophet himself, brought the news. Asa Eliyahu become a pischa de marasa. Elio, Elijah the prophet himself, came and stood by the entrance of the tent. Omar who is going to go and give the news over to Bar Yechai, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, that the Roman Emperor, the Roman Caesar, Caesar, Caesar is Caesar, that the Roman Caesar has died and the the decree has been nullified. So the Rabbi Shimon hears this. Oh, okay, it's time to leave the cave. Nafku, Nafku, they leave the cave now. They are now very, very holy tzaddikim. They're very holy, righteous people. They spent 12 years doing nothing but learning Torah. As long as they were awake, they were learning Torah. So now they were very, very, they were achieved a very, very high, holy, spiritual state. So what do they, what happens as soon as they leave the cave? Chazu, they saw. Chazu, inche, they saw people. The Kakravi Vazari. They saw people plowing and sowing seeds, working the ground. Omar, so they were shocked to see people actually doing mundane things. They were in such a high spiritual state, they couldn't, they were so shocked to see that someone would do something other than learning Torah. That's how in the spiritual state they were. Omar, he said, Whoa, Wow, they are negating the, the eternal life. What does it mean, eternal life? 
because there's an, another Talmud that says, Ashri, Ashri Adam Shabbala Kamet Talmud Biyade. Happy is the person who comes to the world to come and he has his learning in his hands. Because someone that learns Torah, that's the only thing that takes that, that carries a person to the world to come. No money, not even socks. There's a famous story of, of a certain rich person who said to his children, I want to be buried with my socks. He wrote that in his will. And after he died, they tried burying him in his socks and they failed to do so. And before he died, he actually wrote a second will and told them to write the will only after the funeral, read the will only after the funeral. So they tried to bury him in the socks, they failed to do so. And only after the funeral, they opened the second will. I'm saying the story very close. They opened the second will only to find that he said, now that you buried me and you weren't able to bury me with my socks, the message is very clear that as rich as I was, one thing is for certain, when you leave this world, you will not even be able to take your socks with you. So the only thing that we take to the world to come is Torah study. So Rabbi, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and Rabbi Elazar, his son, said, Whoa, these people are negating study of Torah, which is the eternal life. And instead working on Chayisha, the, the temporary life, because they're working on the ground. Everything that we enjoy in this world is only temporary. Ha'ilam ha'zed daimu l'prezder, the ethics of our fathers teaches us, this whole world is only an antechamber. Ha'zgei sa'atzmecha l'prezder, k'deshe t'ikonz t'traklan. This whole world is all about preparing yourself in the antechamber in order that you get yourself into the hall, the great hall, which is the world to come. So they, they were very shocked to see people working, doing things. Kol makim shenosin e'nehem miyad nisraf. They were in such a high spiritual state Wherever they gazed, they were gazing with burning eyes because they couldn't, they couldn't handle the fact that people were working and not studying Torah. But because they were great tzaddikim, any place that they looked with burning eyes, the place went up in fire. So they looked at a field, huh? the field went up in fire. Everything that they looked at burned, went up in flames. It was at that moment, Yatzah Baskal, a heavenly voice suddenly came out of Amr Lahem and said to them, Lahachu ve'lami yatzasem. Did you people come out to destroy my world? Go back to your cave. Go back to where you came from. You're coming out here to destroy my world? Go back to your cave. You are not ready to come out. So they realized that they did wrong. So they went back to their cave and they sat another 12 months saying to themselves, that Gehenna, loosely translated purgatory, hell, is only a, per a soul only endures Gehenna, purgatory, for 12 months. That's the maximum. So they said to themselves, we deserve Gehenna for what we are doing, destroying God's world. So let's go back to our cave, which is anti-civilization. So we separate ourselves from society for 12 months because that, is, that will be our atonement. Compared to Gehenna Purgatory, which is for 12 months. After 12, that's the Talmud. After 12 months, Yatasa Baskal, a heavenly voice of Amr, and says, Sulmi Maraschem, now go out of your caves. Now it's time to go out of your cave. Similar to Noach, Noah and the Teva. He built an ark. And after sitting there for a whole year, a year and 11 days, in the ark with the whole world destroyed, God actually had to tell him, Same in Hateva, go out of the ark. Don't sit in your bubble of Torah anymore. Teva can also mean a word. In the word of Torah, as much as we want to hide away from the world and immerse ourselves in Torah as being the only comfort and get away from the mundane world, God tells us, Tzeim in Teva, it's time to go out as well. So in the same fashion, God is telling Rabbi Shimon by Chayin his son, Rabbi Elazar, Tzoomi Marasim, now it's time to go out of your cave. Now, Nafku, now they come out a second time. Kol Hecha Dahavi Machi Rabbi Elazar Havi Masi Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Elazar still did not learn his lesson, his son. And everywhere Rabbi Elazar gazed was still going up in flames. Rabbi Shimon Bayechai, his father, however, attained a new spiritual level where he was now able to work with the world. So by the way, from here we learn that being aloof from the world is not the ultimate thing. The highest spiritual state is actually when one is working with the world, when one is actually actively involved in the world. It says, Kedoshim Tiyu, you have to be holy. And the holiest thing that we can do in this world, by the way, is marriage, which is 
the opposite of what other religions preach. Other religions preach in order to come close to God, you have to separate yourself from this world. And the Torah teaches us, no, the ultimate is to actively be involved in the world. As Rabbi Zagri also said, um, I think this was yeah, two weeks ago, Asher yase adam v'chai bahem. The whole purpose of living in this world is v'chai bahem. You have to live in this world. Chai bahem. Inside of them, you're making the mundane physical world, you're elevating it. That is the ultimate highest state. So whatever Rabbi Loza was causing to burn up, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai would fix it. He would restore it back. And in this way, that's how they left the cave. So what happened? Rabbi Loza, my son, do not be concerned that the entire world is not learning Torah. Because, yes, it is true that we need people in this world to have Tairasi and Manasseh, that the learning Torah is their work, is their trade. We need people to learn Torah all day. But you know what, my son Rabbi Lazar? We will be the ones. It is okay that other people have to work for a living. We will be the representatives of this world that will be doing nothing but learning Torah. Me and you, my son Rabbi Lazar, me and you together, we will be the representatives of this entire world. We will stay and study Torah all our lives and represent the world. Okay. And with this attitude, Rabbi Lazar stopped burning everything that he saw. He got the point. For those who actually read Azamir Bishvachin, that is the the hymns of, of the Arizal, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, on Friday nights by the meal, there is actually a term called Midane Asa. Midane Asa La'aris, I was the last couple of Chalos, and I forgot the beginning part of that. What's Midane Asa? They are Hadassim, myrtle branches. So he sees someone, they come to the city, and they see that someone is running past them with two myrtle branches, Virahit, Bein Hashmashis, and his Arab Shabbos is coming close to the Shabbos, and he's running with two myrtle branches. Amrulay, Hani Lamalach. So they said to him, these two great sages, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and his son Rabbi Loza, say to this man, Why do you have? Why are you running? Well, what is this? Amrulahu, he said to them, Lechvayt Shabbos. This is to honor the Shabbos. Vetiski Lach Bechad. So they say to him, If you're honoring the Shabbos, it's already enough to have one myrtle branch. Why do you have two? So he answers them, Chad keneged zacher v'chad keneged shamar. He says, because when it comes to Shabbos, God says, zacher siyam ha-shabbos akacha, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, and shamar siyam ha-shabbos akacha, guard and watch the holy Shabbos to keep it holy. So because the Torah, when it comes to Shabbos, when it comes to observing the Sabbath, says zacher and shamar, remember and guard and keep. To, so to commemorate these two expressions of Shabbos, zacher and shamar, shamar v'zacher, v'dibur echad, guarding and remembering, so for that, I'm honoring Shabbos with two myrtle branches. Which, by the way, the commentaries explain, this is the origin for us, for women, lighting two yes. candles on Shabbos. Because the origin of lighting Shabbos candles, as is brought in the Code of Jewish Law, is all about illuminating the house. It's all power of Shalom Bayis, peace and serenity in the house. You cannot have peace and serenity in the house when the house is dark. So the women light candles for the concept of, of bringing peace and serenity to the house because they have light. You can see where you're going. So where, where do we have the concept of two? If it's all if one one candle, one big fire is good enough. So what do you need two for? The origin comes from this Talmud over here. It says the sage, the concept of lighting two candles. Now, of course, there's a custom. You know, mothers, uh, the more children they have, to light more candles. But the origin, the, the basis of the custom is two candles. Based on this Talmud, where the man was saying, because of zakhar and shamer, because of remembrance and guarding these two expressions, I have two myrtle branches. When Rabbi Shimon hears this, when Rabbi, when they when these two sages witness this. This man running, he's running to bring two myrtle branches to his home for the sake of Shabbos. Amalei Lebrei Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai turns to the son Rabbi Lazar. Chazi kam mechavivim mitzvahs al Yisrael. Look how precious and beloved the mitzvahs are to Israel. Yosef datayu. So now they were fully ready to deal with the world because they see, they saw, and were inspired of how beloved and precious the mitzvahs were to the Jewish people. So their minds were at ease, further at ease, and they were ready to join society. Doesn't the, uh, doesn't the, the bracha on Shabbos say near Shabbat? One? Well, Hadlik near, that's correct. 
Because, again, because the basis of the mitzvah is really one candle. So it's only one of those candles that's an actual mitzvah. The fact that we light two is a custom which originates from this Talmud. So you're right. Now, Shama Rabbi Pinchas ben Ya'ir. There was a sage, Rabbi Pinchas ben Ya'ir, who was chasne, who was the son-in-law of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai had a daughter who married Rabbi Pinchas ben Ya'ir. Nafik la'apeg. He heard that his illustrious father-in-law, Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, and his brother-in-law, Rabbi Lazar, had come back. He went out to greet them. He went out to welcome them. Ayla l'veib nani. He brought him into his house. He began tending to him. He was physically weak after spending 13 years covered in sand in a cave. He saw that Rabbi, Rabbi Shem Baichai was covered with cracks in the skin. After sitting in dried sand for 13 years, he literally, his skin was full of cracks. It was coming apart. What happens when Rabbi Pinchas ben Yar sees his father-in-law with cracks all over his body? Have a kabachi. He began crying and weeping, seeing his father-in-law in such a bitter state. The dimas eni The tears started falling on the skin of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, which caused him to start screaming in pain, because the the last thing he wanted to do was put, put salty salt. tears in open wound, salt in open wounds. It was very very painful for Rabbi Shimon. Woe is to me that I'm seeing you, my father-in-law, in such a state. It's horrible. Happy are you that you see me in this state. If you had not seen me in this state, you would not see me in such a state of holiness. Here's how advanced Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai's Torah learning happened after 13 years in the cave. Before, he, before Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai escaped the government, it used to be that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai posed a question. His son-in-law, Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yor, would be able to give 12 answers to every question his father-in-law gave. But after 13 years in the cave, Rabbi Pichas ben Yair would pose a question, and now his father, Rabbi Shimon bar Yechai, could give 24 answers, double the amount. Every question that he posed, his father law can now give 24 answers to every question. And at this point in time, his Tairasi or Manasseh, at this point in time, Rabbi Shimon bar Yechai's Torah learning became his trade. In fact, it says that one time there was a drought in the land of Israel, and they were trying to pray and pray for rain, and nothing came. They decided to turn to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. This is a Talmud, by the way. And they asked him to pray for rain. Instead of praying Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this is very famous, there's a lot of Hasidus on this. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai instead gave a Torah teaching on the verse, which means, behold, how good and how, how, how sweet. When brothers, when people sit together, when there's brotherhood. When there's camaraderie, when there's unity. And he expounded on this verse saying, the fact that two brothers have unity, that means that causes that there's unity up on high. And when there's unity up on high, it brings a higher level of divine blessings. And as he said that, it started pouring outside. So from his Torah learning game, pouring out, again, began pouring outside. Which is a reason, by the way, why there's another custom to sing a song, Hini Matev Manayim Shevesachim Gam Yachad, on Lagba Emer. So we sing that song, and we also do things together. So there's a concept, there is a concept, that when you build a bonfire, you sit around it, you sing songs, there's a concept of being together, making a party, having people together, togetherness and unity. This is also in celebration of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay, uh, we're finishing off. So now, now he's back in society. milsa. Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, because God made me a miracle, which caused me to stay alive, right, and saved me and gave me all of this Torah learning, I have to pay back. So how do I pay back? Let me try to fix something that's missing in this world. How, where do I learn this from? Because it says, And Yaakov came complete, and I'm finishing the verse, to the city of Shechem. When Yaakov came to the city of Shechem, 
What does it mean he came shalem, complete? Amarav, Rav expounded on this to mean shalim begufe, shalim be mamani, shalim be terase. Vayichanes pnei, it says he came complete in his body, complete in his money, and complete in his Torah learning. He had the ultimate. Now, out of thanks that Yaakov Avinu, that Yaakov our father was blessed to be complete with money, complete with Torah learning, and complete with his body, complete in health. So Yaakov decided, he, out of thanks to God for all of that, he wanted to pay back. So how did he pay back the city of Shechem? It says, Vayichan is Pnei He favored the face of the city. What does it mean? Amarav matbea tikin lehem. Yaakov Avinu, out of thanks, did something to benefit the city that he arrived in, out of thanks for all the goodness God gave him. He began by setting up a currency in the city of Shechem. A proper currency. Uh, of a Shmuel, Amar Shvakim tikin lehem. Shmuel says, he set up marketplaces. Rabbi Yochanan Omer Machtzeis Tikkun Lehem. Rabbi Yochanan said he set up bathhouses for the sake of hygiene. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said Yaakov Avinu, out of thanks to God, he did that to the city of Shechem. So me, out of thanks to God for these, for being able to survive and all everything that God did for me, I want to pay back as well. So Omar he said to the people of the city, Ika Milsa Debayla Tikkuni. Is there anything over here that needs fixing? Is there anything I can help to be of help? Amrule, so that they said to Rabbi Shimon Baichai, Ikaduchta de Ispa Safik Tuma. There's a big area of land that we're not sure that the place we're we're pretty sure that the place is impure. And there's a problem. This whole area of land, we think that there may be some bodies buried there under the ground. And we don't know where. And there's a problem for Kohanim. Because the Kayin is not allowed to walk in an area, we just it's, it's in this week's parasha, the Kidashta. The Kayin has an obligation to remain holy, which means not coming in contact with a dead body. And so a Kayin would not be able to walk around this land. So they said, we have a problem. So we that's a problem. We have this big area, open area of land, and we don't know where the bodies are buried. We don't know where the bodies are. Omar... So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai said back to them, now I'm, I'm on the top of Lamed Al, I'm on the 34 side A. Ika inish diyadid is chazik? Halchatara? Is there anybody who's still alive that may know where originally there was a place that was pure? Amrulei, halhu sabakan, halhu sabakan, the great saba, the great elder, who was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, also a very, very great sage, who, by the way, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai was a te- one of the teachers of Rabbi Yakiva, who in turn was a teacher of Rabbi Shimon Ba'chai. says, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai was here. Kitzetz ben Zakkai, Turmasi Truma, uh, ben Zakkai gave Truma from a following tree, which he planted in this area. So you can only give Truma from something which is pure. So the fact that he gave Truma from that showed that that piece of land where he, be- where he planted the tree was pure. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai decided to go around. Any ground that was hard, he called it pure. Assuming that because it's hard, that means that there's nothing buried underneath it, which causes the ground to soften. Any place which was, which was soft, he called it impure. And with this, he went around and he began building little barriers. And in this way, he established what was pure and impure, and he created a path that allowed the Kohanim to be able to walk through. And that's what Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai did to the people of that city. Amar Ahu Saba, so there was a certain elder who lived in the city, who began scoffing and ridiculing Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai. And he said, Look, Tihar Rabbi Yochai Beis HaKvaris. <coughs> Rabbi Shimon Ba'echai is now purifying a cemetery. He said this in a derogatory way. So Amalei, Rabbi Shum, now don't remember, let's not forget, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was in a very, very high spiritual state. And you don't mess with this rabbi. You don't. What happens? Amalei said to him, If not for the fact that you were, weren't with us, The fact that you were with us, but you weren't with us when we tried to rectify the situation and come up with a ruling that would benefit the city, now you're saying, after the fact, you're saying that you're trying to be with us and you know better. 
He says, He did a call of a He said, if prostitutes help each other with makeup, putting makeup on their faces to help each other, so shouldn't if, if the prostitutes do that to each other, so then Torah scholars, how much more so should they not help each other and lift each other up? He took one look at this elder and the elder dropped dead. Looked at him and he died. Nafik Lashuka Shuka, now Rabbi Shimon Bayechai goes out to the marketplace, Chazil Yehuda ben Geirim, and he sees Yehuda ben Geirim. Who was Yehuda ben Geirim? If you remember, he was the person that began spreading the story that Rabbi Shimon spoke against the government, which caused the Roman government to want to execute him. So he sees that Yehuda ben Geirim, he was the person responsible for causing him to have to escape. Amar, he said out, Rabbi Shimon said out loud, Adai in Yeshla Zeba'elam? Is this thing still in this world? Nasim Bay'enav, he gazed at him, Basal Gal Shatzamis, and turned him into a mound of bones. <laughs> End to the Mishnah, which basically ends the story. So this is the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yachai. Those who are with me in Tractate Brachis, you may remember on page 9, Daf Tes, we had this famous teaching that if one, introduction to the teaching, that if someone went through an entire night and it comes dawn, it comes almost morning time, it comes almost sunrise, and the person did not say the evening, the evening Shema. So it says, Rabbi Shimon in the name of Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, that you can still say the evening Shema. Because there's a teaching of Rabbi Shimon Ba'ichai that even at the time between dawn and sunrise, it's considered night because there are some people that are still sleeping in. Like the teaching of Rabbi Yeshua that the morning time of saying Shema is up until three hours into the day because that's when royalty would wake up. They would sleep in until 10 o'clock. And so now, so Rabbi Shimon in the name of Rabbi Akiva said that that time of day is still considered night time. And what did we end up saying? Kedaihu Rabbi Shimon It is worthwhile, Kedai, it's worthwhile to rely on Rabbi Shimon at a time of stress, at a time of need. Why? From the Talmud, based on the fact that there was one time child, there was one time students, I'm sorry, children of Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel by the one was the one, by the way, in the opening of Tractate Brachos who said you can say the evening Shema the entire night until morning. His own children were one time by a wedding. And because they were by a wedding, they were very, very happy. And, yeah, and they fell asleep. And they woke up. It was almost sunrise. And they were, oi, who forgot the evening Shema? So on that, we said, Kedaihu Rabbi Shimon, it's worthwhile for Rabbi Shimon by Chai Lismechal to rely on him, the Shasat Chak of a time of stress. The, in, the inner explanation of that statement, we learned that in that Talmud. Now we apply it to Lagba Omer, which is next week on Thursday. The famous saying, we apply it now to Rabbi Shimon Baichai because Lagba Omer, next week Thursday, is his holy day. And so on that, we, we say that statement, applying it to Rabbi Shimon Baichai. Kedai Rabbi Shimon, it's worthwhile on Rabbi Shimon Lismechalov to rely on him in Shasat Chak at the time of need, which means, the way we interpret it, the day of Lagba Omer is an auspicious time. It is a time to ask for anything that you need because it's a very holy day. And we can certainly, all of our tefillah, all of our prayers, we can certainly rely on Rabbi Shimon, to rely on him in a time of stress, at a time of need, that we can use those 24 hours, very, very holy hours, the hours of Lagba Omer next week, Thursday, to ask for anything that we need and to appreciate the holiness of this day because we can truly rely on Rabbi Shimon Bayuchai and rely on him in a time of need to answer us and help us with everything that we need. I want to wish everyone a very wonderful Lagba Omer. Let's use the time lighting bonfires, camaraderie, togetherness, unity, and certainly the ultimate unity, Ava Schinam, which is baseless love, which is that's after all what Rabbi Kiva wanted from us. When we celebrate this day with true Ava Yisrael, even before that, tonight, tomorrow, we should merit with the coming of Mashiach immediately now. I mean, I mean, and with that, I mean. happy luck, like, Omar. Thank you all for joining. Gosh, gosh, thank you for yeah. coming. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. So we'll not see you next week. Next week again, Lagba like, Omer. Come to Camp Unona, 5 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And we will resume the week after that.